Quick video today, I think. Let's talk about boring head tricks. Usually, in manual machining, we're concerned with two basic shapes, squares and cylinders. In fact, parts are usually reduced to these two basic forms or a combination of these two forms as much as possible to simplify them and make them cheaper. Generally speaking, the mill handles square shapes and the lathe does the cylinders. But thankfully, our beautifully majestic world is made up of more than just two shapes. There are four. Allow me to introduce cones, and spheres, more precisely tapers and spherical shapes, both concave and convex. Now there are plenty of ways to skin a cat, but today we're talking about tapers and spheres, come on pay attention. Let's start with tapers, and before getting into the boring head, we'll quickly cover the most popular ways to cut tapers. First, the lathe is naturally built to cut cylinders. Any lathe in decent condition and properly installed is designed basically to cut cylinders. The machine ways are parallel to the axis of rotation. The carriage riding on those ways moves the tool along sort of that same parallel line cutting cylinders. The top slide, set at zero degrees, does the same thing. Now unless you've pulled a Stefan Renzetti, you'll be able to swing the top slide such that it's at some angle to the axis of rotation, likely resulting in your first introduction to cutting tapers. You swing the top slide, or the compound, however you like to call it, at some angle to that axis, and when you move the tool, it'll result in a conical cut. The hardest part about cutting tapers, no matter what method you use, essentially comes down to setting up that angle, and how well you set that angle makes the difference between a part that works and one that doesn't. Everything else is basically just mechanics of pushing the tool around and getting material out of the way, but that angle setup is really what it all comes down to. So swinging the top slide is probably the easiest and fastest way to cut tapers. The only downside is that the top slide usually doesn't have that much travel, so if you need a long taper, the top slide won't cut it. The next popular method to cut tapers is with a taper attachment. A taper attachment does just that. It's some attachment or accessory for your lathe that bolts on and allows you to cut tapers as long or as big as the attachment is. If you have a one foot long taper attachment, that's as long of a continuous taper as you can cut. Now, both of those methods change the direction that the tool is traveling in order to cut a taper. But there's another way to get a taper. You leave the tool run straight, and you change the angle of the axis of rotation of the lathe itself. Right, we're dealing with, let's say, two lines here. If you don't want to change the direction of travel that the tool is going, you have to change the direction that the work is rotating in. Now, that might sound complicated, but in all likelihood, your lathe is already doing that. Basically, you offset your tailstock. You skew the axis of rotation, and any quote-unquote straight cut you take will result in a taper. Now, cutting tapers with an offset tailstock is a bit of a pain. First, you have to offset your tailstock and then get it back on center when you're finished. It's not necessarily hard to do, but you have to do it. Second, you'll have to work between centers, meaning a center in the chuck and a center in the tailstock, and use the dog to drive the work. Now, that's not really a big deal, but you do need to work with centers. Now, because you're working with centers, there's only so much you can offset your tailstock. You could really only get away with tapers of a few degrees. You could cut a Morse taper, for example, but that's probably about all the offset I'd personally feel comfortable with. Your centers are sitting in 60 degree center holes, and you know, there's only so much you can push those. Which brings me to the boring head trick using a boring head in the tailstock to dial in the offset you need to cut a taper. Now, I didn't discover this trick, I invented it. Actually, you don't usually remember where you pick this kind of stuff up, but this one in particular came to me from the illustrious Mr. Stevenson quite a few years ago. Engineer, machinist, and just all around man about town. Anyway, the boring head goes in the tailstock, making sure the head is level with the ways. The head gets a socket to receive a small ball bearing. The headstock gets the same thing. The work needs center features and is driven with a dog. This is just like working between centers, but the balls allow for much more range than 60 degree centers would. That, and you needn't move your tailstock. From there, it's business as usual. Use the dial on your boring head to set the taper and go to work. Would have probably been smart to add some oil or lubricant to the bearings too. Here you can see mine are warming up a bit.
So there you have it. Respectable looking taper, I think. And since we're working between centers, it's not a problem to take the part out, say to check the taper, reinstall it, and tweak the offset at the boring head to make corrections. That's sometimes tricky to do, even in a collet, let alone a chuck. Now, to be honest, I've only had to use this trick once, I believe. This is probably my third time after having experimented a bit when I first learned about it. I recall using it once for a taper I couldn't get access to by swinging the top slide. It was a short taper, but I think it was a shaft with a flange or armature or something on it that interfered with the top slide. So I broke out the boring head trick. Let's have a quick look now at using a boring head to cut spherical shapes. Here we're on the mill, and I've prepped a small plastic round to cut a ball end. The work is mounted in a rotary table. The boring head is installed and the spindle tipped so the tool clears what will become the shank, I suppose, on the far side of the ball, and swings just below center line on the ball itself. The intersection of the sweep of the boring head and the rotation of the work result in a sphere. Well, I think it does in this case. You'll have to think through the setup and the angles to figure out if it's truly, really a sphere, or just a boring head spheroidosaurus, which might be its scientific name. It didn't take me long to upgrade to power feed. I set the boring head larger than the ball I needed. Figured I'd rough it out and then finish it, but I must have gotten carried away and I totally forgot to bring the head into size. You can see here I undercut the shank on one side and didn't quite reach the center on the ball end. Basically the diameter of my boring head sweep was larger than the ball I wanted to cut. But all in all, not bad looking. Again, maybe not the easiest way to do this, but knowing it's possible might give you some options with, you know, stranger parts that you might run into in the future. Next, let's try cutting a concave shape. The rotary table is now horizontal, but that'll depend on the size of the feature you're trying to cut and your particular situation. I've also, of course, flipped the tool in the boring head as now we're cutting on the inside instead of the outside. And here it was just a matter of keeping up with the rotary table as the machine was sort of sweeping through that circular path. At this point I noticed the diameter of the cut was growing faster than the depth, so I tipped the head of the milling machine just a little bit more. If you recall back to the head tram video, this isn't cutting a perfect sphere. It's sort of a revolution of a paraboloid. The bottom of the cut is a bit flat. I tried to keep the boring head diameter to the size of the ball we just cut, and off the cuff it looks like a relief cut in the bottom of the aluminum part might result in a good fit up, like a countersink to cut away just the flat section. Now for smallish features like this, a ball nose end mill is probably the smart way to go. But if you want to hollow out something like a, a salad bowl, well, that'd be quite the expensive end mill. So that's about the long of it, I think. Although the point of this was to show some boring head options, perhaps add something to your little bag of tricks, more than that, I think it goes to show that with some clever thinking outside of the proverbial box, you may be able to get your equipment to do things that might not be readily apparent at first blush. Now, these may very well be somewhat dramatic examples, but in machining, especially manual machining, I think a big part of being successful at it comes from sort of having that big bag of tricks and knowing when to use them. Like, I think just seeing this kind of stuff, maybe, gives insight even into simpler operations of the machines themselves. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that. Maybe you saw something new. As always, thanks for watching.